Having celebrated Grendel's demise, the Danes and Yates settle in for the night. For the first time in twelve years, the Danish thanes spend the night in their own mead hall. Their arms are at the ready, but their guards are down. Though she is a monster, Grendel's mother mourns her son's death and broods on it, along with all her other grievances against God and the societies of men. Grief racked and ravenous, desperate for revenge, the poet says, the monster mother comes to Heorat to glut her revenge. She grabs the nearest warrior, snatches her son's arm from the wall, and flees back to her horrid fen to savor her revenge undisturbed. Beowulf can do nothing to stop the monster because he is sleeping elsewhere, part of his reward for vanquishing Grendel. The lesson here? The battle isn't over until all the enemy are defeated. We are often most susceptible just after a significant victory. We're most likely to fall to temptation just after we've overcome some significant temptation. Today's celebration will become tomorrow's dirge, unless we are watchful and ever ready to fight. At this point in the poem, it's important to notice something about the monsters. Both Grendel and his mother are monstrous in a way familiar to us. They are violent, bloody, terrifying creatures of the night. But for the Anglo-Saxons, They are monsters also because they invert the ideal roles of society. Grendel is described as an evil retainer, the thane whose envy leads him to usurp the throne. The poet describes Grendel's mother as the antithesis of a peace weaver, an evil mother whose thirst for revenge overpowers her duty to craft peace. And the dragon, who comes to the last part of the poem, represents the corrupt ring-giver, whose lust for gold leads him to suspicion and violence and cruelty against his own. All the monsters in Beowulf are monstrous, then, because they incarnate the type of disloyal, selfish violations of social ideals that lead to bloodshed and civil war, eventually to the complete devastation of the society. The poet amplifies this personification of inverted social roles by surrounding each monster with examples of characters who either exemplify, uh, human characters, who either exemplify the ideal social role or the monstrous perversion of it. Examples of those who fail to uphold their social loyalties. Let's consider Grendel. Before we meet Grendel, we first meet Shield Chiefson and Hrothgar great Danish kings whose ideal leadership makes the Danes make the Danes a strong nation. They are loyal to their social roles. Then Grendel appears, who's obviously obviously the perversion of the social role. After Grendel, we meet Beowulf, another very powerful, superlatively strong man, stronger than Grendel even, but a man who is loyal to his social position and he is motivated by a desire to help others. But then we also meet Unferth and Hrothgar's ambitious nephew, Hrothulf, two Cain-like usurpers who are willing to violate family ties to serve their selfish desires. So by surrounding Grendel with such examples, the poet amplifies the true monstrosity of Grendel's character and behavior. But notice that his purpose is not to say that the greatest evil is outside the community. His purpose isn't to amplify the external monsters, but rather, by mentioning Unferth and Rothulf, the poet stresses that as terrible as Grendel is, a far greater threat to the community lies within the heart of each man. There is a monster more terrifying than Grendel in every human heart in the Anglo-Saxon society. All of the thanes have the seed of sedition and greed planted in the fertile soil of the human heart. Unless they watch their hearts and souls as vigilantly as they watch their frontiers, they will fall to the enemy within their own walls. And this is true of both men and women, the poet stresses. The poet also surrounds Grendel's mother with examples of loyal and disloyal peace weavers, queens, and mothers who have direct similarities. On the night of the monster mother's raid, the Shope sings the Finsburg episode, but highlights the grief of Hildebur, who also loses her son in the initial fighting. But Hildebur doesn't seek to avenge her son's death on her own. Rather, she accepts his death because of her role as peace weaver. She is the knot of peace in her own person, 
and her actions directly affect the two nations to whom she is related. Huelthiao also has maternal concerns for the safety of her sons, but tries to protect them within the role of peace weaver. She wants to prevent future threats to her sons, but does so not through intrigue, extortion, or cunning, but through formal speeches that strengthen ties of kinship and loyalty. Shortly after hearing of Hildebert's grief and listening to Weyalthiao's speeches, the Danes go to bed and Grendel's mother attacks. She also is a mother grieving the loss of a son, but she refuses to be as passive and stoic as Hildebert. She takes aggressive, masculine action and raids Heorot. What is particularly monstrous about this is her greater concern for vengeance than for peacemaking. Hildebert by the way, isn't praiseworthy because she is a docile, helpless female, but because she subordinates her grief for the good of the community. Any attempt on her part to avenge her son would only lead to an explosion of feudal violence. She is more concerned about the community than about her own desires and loss. The violence of Grendel's mother is a direct antithesis of Hildebert and Huelthiel's faithfulness to their vital roles as weavers of peace. Though the attack is far less bloody than Grendel's, the violence of, this, of the second monster is so unexpected that Hrothgar falls into despair, fearing many more years of terror raids on his hall. Rest? What is rest? Sorrow has returned. Alas for the Danes, he cries. His despair is deepened by the loss of Asherah, the thane killed by Grendel's mother. Hrothgar says that Asherah was soulmate to me, a true mentor, my right-hand man when the ranks clashed, and our boar crests had to take a battering in the line of action. Asherah was everything the world admires in a wise man and a friend. Hrothgar recognizes that Grendel's mother came for revenge and has taken up the feud because of last night. Hrothgar compares his despair to what thanes feel when they experience the loss of the king, one of the worst tragedies that can come on a community. Despite being a wise, experienced king, the sudden reversal of fortune brought by the Monster Mother's raid, combined with the loss of a close friend, have temporarily broken Hrothgar. He laments not, his, not only his own loss, but also the often overwhelming sense of impending inevitable doom that pervade the Anglo-Saxon mind. Arising from the mythology of Germanic paganism, which teaches that the history of the world ends in a cosmic battle that annihilates absolutely everything, the Anglo-Saxon mind seems to be haunted by the belief that the world is ultimately tragic. All human action is ultimately futile. Though motivated by grief, Hrothgar's despairing lament is really the fear, I think, that lies at the heart of nearly all pre-Christian Germanic cultures. It is not too much to say, either, that it is also the fear that lies at the heart of every culture, no matter how sophisticated or advanced or post-Christian it becomes. <laughs>